Are any unaccompanied minors from the U.S.-Mexico border in Virginia? And if so, does the Catholic Church help them? Um, yes, there are. Um, Thank you. Yes, there are unaccompanied minors here in Virginia, um, and we do have Catholic Charities who are assisting them. Um, what they are providing are basically um, family reunification. They're doing child welfare checks to ensure that these kids are, are safe and not trafficking victims, ensuring that they can reunify with a parent or a sponsor because that's a more effective use of resources. Um, and then they're also being given um, information about how to enroll in school and how to comply with their immigration proceedings. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, there's some here in this community, there's some also in, in Richmond, and then there's a number of shelters that are operated throughout uh, Virginia of children who have not been released uh, to family or approved sponsors. And I will just add um, on that because I oversee OGAR Immigrant Services, which is one of the programs of Catholic Charities. We do have um, seven bilingual immigration attorneys, and we are helping unaccompanied minors um, in our diocese. Uh, Virginia is the seventh largest state nationwide that is a receiver of, uh, a recipient state for these um, children that are being released from detention, and then they are put in deportation proceedings. Um, we have clients that are two years old. Uh, that were brought here on the back of, you know, on the tops of trains by their, you know, nine-year-old brother, for example, um, fleeing gang violence, um, things like that. And so we are doing our best to to at least help them through the crazy immigration legal process, especially since they don't even speak the language and they are not afforded a public defender um, because they are um, undocumented. Um, sorry for the brevity of the answers, but um, I, I'm happy to stay after and, and, you know, answer any other questions if you have about that. Um, where does the law regarding illegal immigration, uh, which countries need to preserve the life of all and to keep order safety, intersect or come into play with Catholic teachings? Does anyone want to take a stab at that one? So I guess, uh, what's the Catholic teaching response to um, the countries need to preserve life and keep order and safety? give the quick policy and then I will defer to, to Father. I'm going to give a quick policy of what we're doing and I'll defer to, uh, to Father. Um, I think that all countries have that responsibility and we work really hard to ensure um, that some of these countries who have been traditionally sending countries um, are doing better in terms of um, following the law, being places where people can raise families, uh, really being places that are transparent with better judiciaries and police systems. That's part of the root causes when we talk about the need to stop migration, irregular migration. Um, part of that is looking at why are people leaving. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why I, uh, many of you are sure are familiar with the work of Catholic Relief Services. They do a lot of work in some of the, the countries that are sending um, individuals here who people are fleeing from. So one of the things that we always think about when we look at immigration policy development is looking at the root causes and looking to ensure that we can stabilize and secure some of these countries uh, so there are better opportunities, there are more safe places for people to stay and they don't feel the need to migrate. Um, and so I can, you know, Turn it over to Father, I think, on some of the, the social teaching. Okay, it looks like, I guess, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly here, it is like there's a, uh, it's talking about a distinction between um, the need to preserve life of all and versus, or to keep order and safety. First of all, keeping order and safety in a society is always an issue. I mean, in all human societies, everybody has every law, every society has laws to keep order and safety uh, in one way or the other. And so, whether they're dealing with uh, undocumented or quote illegals or or citizens, uh, it's, it's this is an issue that is always at stake uh, in always at stake in, in, in civil governance. Um, it's you know the duty of part of the common good. To, you know, to provide the peace, the law, and the order by which 
all peoples can thrive and fulfill their, you know, their, their purposes and, and goodness in life, both as individuals, as families, and groups. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, the right to life is also you know, something that all societies have an obligation to protect as well. So, and then we, when you start looking at all of these issues in particular, this is where, you know, this is where you do, yes, you once get into the prudential aspects of them, but at the same time, that they're not strictly prudential because we still have to maintain and respect the dignity of the human person. Uh, so, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm answering that rather abstractly because you're, the question entails a, a multiplicity of issues, uh, not just integration. Uh, but that said, I mean, yes, the law and order is part of the common good, but at the same time, we have to remember what is the law and the order supposed to serve? It's supposed to serve the development of the human person, uh, irrespective of who they are. So. Uh, the next question. Um, the SIVs, the Special Immigrant Visa Holders, that Gregory was mentioning um, from Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, what is the reason for the slowdown in having them come to the U.S.? All I can suggest is um, there has been a reassignment of personnel overseas. They, they call them circuit riders. So the ones that would go into the urban centers or into the refugee camps and do the interviews, the vetting interviews, they have reassigned a significant percentage of those from overseas assignments to stateside assignments. I've heard anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the overseas staff. I, I don't know what the number is, but a, a large portion. They've been reassigned to this country to handle the backlog of asylum cases. So there are going, and there's some new administrative judges that have been appointed. Hopefully that's going to pick up some momentum and some speed to work through the backlog. But it's not adding any, it's not adding any more personnel to do this. It's just taking from one pot and putting it in another. So maybe the, the processing of the SIVs is just a collateral damage from just not having the staff there to be able to do the processing. If there's another motive behind that, I, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. So. I'll just add that um, when last year we had over 100 of the individuals who are the refugee core officers who do the interviewing um, and at some point this summer we know that there were approximately 60 uh, refugee core officers and they're not making the normal uh, uh, circuit rides to some of the places where traditionally we have processed the SIVs before. So um, it is, I think, a reorganizing of how the administration is choosing to uh, kind of look at the processes that they're resettling refugees. But um, you know, it's certainly a reduction in the capacity to assist um, refugees and SIVs just uniformly across the board. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about that I'm seeing, and I'm trying to sum them all up about sanctuary cities. I did want to be able to at least respond to those questions that are out there. Um, one of them is, what is the official policy regarding sanctuary cities and its, and its impact upon safety of all citizens? I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at that. Sure. So I, I just want to be real clear. Um, so sanctuary cities are relating to the law enforcement um, administration of a city and its choice to whether to engage with ICE, um, which is Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, which is an office of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, cities uh, can make the choice of whether they want to engage with the Department of Homeland Security in, in what's known as a, a detainer request. If you pick someone up um, and you run through you know, all of their vitals, you find out that they're undocumented. Um, the municipality, as the law is written right now, has the right to choose whether they're going to turn that person over to ICE or whether they are not. Um, it may seem like a simple question of safety, but I do want to back up to Father's point about subsidiarity. Um, we traditionally have had the federal government do the enforcement of immigration law. We have had local and state law enforcement do the work of local and state law enforcement and community policing. Um, and the reason 
for that uh, divide over the years has been about community trust and it's also been about local prerogative. Um, we see in certain instances that uh, you know, there's jurisdictions that make a variety of choices on this. Again, local communities have to choose whether they want to work with the Department of Homeland Security or whether they don't. Uh, but the official position here, I think, is to recognize the right of the local government on this and, and see that they are, um, you know, making the decision as, as the local kind of authority. Uh, one of the things I think we do, uh, the bishops are concerned about having worked with a lot of immigrants, um, particularly trafficking victims, um, sometimes we see also U visas, so crime victims, is that when we have seen in our work Sometimes when law enforcement is deputized to do federal immigration enforcement work, you do see people who are less willing to come forward and work with law enforcement. You do see less engagement in immigration communities. Um, it is a fact that you know, certain communities have seen decreased reporting on domestic violence uh, and other crimes um, on this issue. But, Sanctuary cities have nothing to do uh, with the church giving sanctuary. That's a different issue of sanctuary, and it has nothing to do with local municipalities issuing benefits like access to hospital or health care or other things. It is an, a simple exchange with law enforcement, whether law enforcement will make the choice to work with the federal government on immigration enforcement or not. Um, the U.S. Catholic community has been very quiet about the plight of the Middle Eastern Catholics, Greek Catholics, Coptic, and Orthodox Christians. We don't seem to be active in helping them, especially those facing, facing excuse me, death and persecution. Anyone want to? <laughs> it's not really a question, it's a statement, but I, I don't know if you want to respond to the sense. Um, so, uh, the USCCB, along with Catholic Relief Services um, and other Catholic partners like Catholic Charities USA, has been doing uh, work on religious minority refugees who have not been admitted. Um, like the other refugee populations that we've seen a real decrease of admittances, religious minorities, including Christians, and Chaldean Christians in particular, have seen a real uh, decline in their admittance as well. Um, this issue has been brought up with Secretary Pompeo and is particularly, I think, on the mind of the bishops right now because we're in the period of working on the presidential determination, which is the number, as Greg mentioned, that'll determine the kind of uh, ceiling of refugees for the year, for the next year. I urge you, um, whoever wrote the question, I'm happy to follow up, but I urge you also to mention this to your lawmaker because uh, Congress, you know, I think it's Representative Comstock, has oversight capacity on this. And Meyer. we. Meyer. Don Meyer. Don Meyer. I'm sorry, I thought it was Barbara Comstock, but um, has, has a capacity to do oversight on this issue, and we are trying to work with lawmakers to heighten awareness on this and make sure that the State Department considers. So if you're interested, follow up with me. I, I'm happy to help draft some points for you. I actually commune with the Melkite Greek Catholics, so that's uh, Syrian, Lebanese, uh, the uh, Atmarchy of uh, Synods in Damascus. Uh, the uh, Melkite Senate is very interested in rebuilding the Christian communities there and not having the people leave and creating conditions within uh, Syria and uh, especially that they can return home. So uh, I, the, the Knights of Columbus uh, in, your, in your parishes, uh, they are actually very active. Not only, it, it's different because they can opt to be included or not, but the Knights of Columbus actually has a, a support program for Christians in the Middle East also, the Catholic Near East Welfare Association, C-N-E-W-A. Uh, check their website out, uh, and you could make a donation or be an advocate there to uh, help preserve that Christian community in the, uh, in the, the Near East. And also, uh, Orthodox Christian, International Orthodox Christian Charities, IOCC, is also very active among all Christians and Palestinians and Arab and Christian communities there. So those are three good organizations that you could look to to get some more information and to help keep the Christian Christian presence in the Holy Land. All right, we have time for 
for one more question. Um, what are the biggest pushbacks you hear from lawmakers when trying to move forward policy infused with Catholic social teaching? I, I can take that one. Yeah. I figured yeah. I would, I would give it to Jeff. <laughs> Go for it, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I think it's um, probably what I hear the most is, is what I would call the, the either or versus the both and approach. So. Um, you know, the, with all, all the focus being on enforcement and categorizing somebody as you know, legal or illegal, documented or undocumented, um, whereas I, I think kind of a, you know, a more global, comprehensive approach would be helpful where we, we start with the, the dignity of the human person uh, and, then, and then through that lens we look at the whole range of issues. We look at enforcement, certainly. Um, we also look, look at um, what's consonant with dignity and um, what's uh, in best in terms of furtherance of public safety, in terms of education, uh, in terms of the, the future of our commonwealth and, and the future of our country. Um, so I, I think we can, we can look at, at all of these things and sort of a multitask, if you will, instead of of, of just saying, well, it's, it's either this or that. Cool. I just want to address another question that uh, has come up a little bit, also has come up a few times, you know, in face-to-face with -face some Christians. They'll say, Father, the minute you take them in your rectory, I'll take them out, or, or take them to the bishop. I'm going to say, let me address that, okay? Uh, first of all, what we're asking people to do in the church, really, is to help them get settled in their home, and this is how we work through MRS, Migration Refugee Services, and get some of their home in the neighborhoods. Um, and so, for example, I remember when I was at the University of Mary Washington, uh, I worked closely with MRS. I see Laurel Collins is here, and we, we worked with her. And uh, you know what we did is, for example, we played soccer. We had the college students play soccer with a lot of the uh, more of the high school age students to help them feel at home in the neighborhood. If I can feel welcome into the Fredericksburg area when I was at the University of Mary Washington's chapel. And you know, it was I'm just taken, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but a good number of those kids that were there were had grown up in um, they were Bhutanese from Bhutan that had were the victims of an ethnic cleansing and had grown up in a uh, in a refugee camp in Nepal, which is, explains why they were very good at soccer. So much else to do in the, in the I guess in the, the camps. But that said, you know, they're finally coming to a place where they can settle into a neighborhood, into a land, a town, and have their own home in their space. And this is what we're seeking to do. Now, if you wish to have somebody settle in your home, I would advise that you go to an agency that can help you with that, because that is a very particular uh, way of welcoming someone. But it's a, very, it's a very particular way. It's not the usual way. Um, and of course, you have to be careful with that, because there's a lot of factors that have to be considered in, 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 in doing something like that. But that said, I think the important thing here is the thrust of what we do here at St. Agnes with MRS, as our aim is to help those who are trying to settle in their own home, to buy them their, like, like uh, Greg was saying, mat their mattresses or their, their forks and knives or help them, you know, look, you know get, take the job interviews or, you know, how to, how to enroll in the school system, et cetera. So, this is the aspect that we can help with here, uh, according to our, uh, you know, our abilities and so forth. So anyway, I would like to conclude here uh, with a prayer. Um, and I also like to always invoke the, the Word of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. When they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph, Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Heavenly Father, help us to look upon the world with the eyes of your son that we may look upon the world with the grace you gave us at our baptism, which is more profound and eternally abiding than our citizenship to any nation, to any nation of earth. Help us to recognize that we're all destined to be citizens of the new heaven and the new earth, the heavenly city, where all 
tears shall be wiped away, and only joy and peace abide. We ask this to you, Heavenly Father, through the prayers of the mother of your divine Son. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming out. Have a blessed evening.